Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to apologize for probably mispronouncing her name. Um, but I'll give it a try. Welcome, Gitte Klitgo. Oh, she's nodding. Yay. It's really well done. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for those of you who do not know Gitte, she is the owner of Native Wired and, and an engineering manager and coach at Mentimeter. Gitte has been an agile coach for more than a decade at leading companies like Spotify, Lego, and IBM. She describes herself as curious, hippie, friend, hugger, geek, and a constant learner. A quote from her homepage that we really liked in the Orga team, um, by using comfort and growth as partners, growth can become more sustainable and larger. It's a dance between the two. Really like that. Thank Gitta, you. thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Nice to see some known faces in the audience as well. It's good to see you. I miss seeing you in person, um, all of you. One day we will meet again. Um, so I'm just going to share my slide. And since we made it work last time, it should also work this time. Yes, it worked. So um, I'm going to talk about comfort and psychological safety at work. So a little bit about me. Uh, uh, my name is Gide Klitko. I uh, am native wired on Twitter. Beware that if you follow me, I do tweet a lot. And my pronouns is she and her. I have been an Agile coach for a very long time, and um, I think the reason I use this picture is that Agile coaches can be so many things. And some people joke that the ones who take care of people are the tree huggers. So I ended up putting this up as an Agile coach, because what I've been doing mostly the last, I guess, eight years, uh, and focusing more and more on it, has been people. It's been the, the softer side, or rather the hard side, where we talk about safety, we talk about collaboration, uh, we talk about some of the things that are actually quite hard. Um, so that's what I've been for a very long time. Um, I have also been a speaker at a bunch of conferences. Uh, this is actually me at a graduation at computer science because I was lucky enough to do it when my cousin graduated from my university 15 years later. Uh, and I really liked the picture. Um, right now, I have just started as an engineering manager and coach at Mentimeter. So far, I'm the manager of one person. Um, so I am still kind of trying to figure out what it means to be a manager. Uh, but the way it's perceived in Mentimeter is that it's about growing people, which I have a lot of experience from uh, being an agile coach. And then I'm a lot of other things. I am um, a big hugger, like I say, uh, but only if the other person wants to be hugged, because it also, that's also something that has to be safe. Uh, so I also do non-physical hugs, because hugging is also about giving my attention to that person for a bit. Um, I'm a unicorn. I'm actually a certified unicorn certifier even. Um, and I have been known very much for being brave, which is, a little bit funny because I have not been brave uh, before 2011, where I met the German Agile community. And um, I put up the logo from the last Agile coach camp that we had. Sadly, we canceled last year and this year due to Corona. Uh, but in 2011, I met the Agile community in Germany and realized that I am not alone. There are other people like me uh, who believe in believe in Agile, but also believe in making the world better. And the last five, six years, I guess, I have been part of organizing the German Agile Coach Camp, uh, which we so hope we can get back next year, uh, because we miss being, seeing each other, uh, exchanging all this information and all the things. Yeah, I saw you, Dade. I miss you. <laughs> um, so, why am I talking about psychologically safe? safe uh, so I, I'm going to start over. Why am I talking about psychological safety? I'm doing this because psychological safety has always been important to me. I just didn't know what it was called until 2017. So it's been important for me, especially as I have discovered that 
once I felt safe, I started growing a lot. I started going from a person trying to hide in a corner to someone who felt okay by stepping up, who were not afraid to speak up about all the things I believed in and uh, not afraid to also take care of other people. And I've kind of taken a little bit care of other people my whole life. I just didn't know what it was called. But I'm gonna start out with a little bit more of a definition from psychological safety and also talk about why it's important. I am happy that we are seeing more and more talks about this um, and that it's gaining some traction because for a very long time, the thing that has been the focus in our organizations has been the phys physical safety. We have all kinds of rules of, of how we wear a hard hat if we're on a building uh, site. Um, we need to hold the banister when we go up the stairs, etc. But we haven't really focused a lot on psychological safety in organizations, which is a little bit interesting because it was actually described the first time it was called psychological safety was in 1965. At least that's the earliest I've been able to find where Edgar Schein and Warren Bennis was looking into how do we create the best learning environment? And what they found out was that to be able to learn, we need to be uncomfortable. We need to have a little bit of discomfort, but that there was a big difference between how people were learning and the ones who were not in a safe environment became anxious. They had anxiety when there was discomfort. But if the environment was safe, then people were learning and wanted to learn even more. So that's kind of when it came into the vocabulary of, of psychology, uh, at least that I have found. I would say I'm not a psychologist, I'm a computer scientist um, and an agile coach. So uh, this is not my so-called expertise, but I've been working with it for a long time. Some more stuff started coming up in 1990 when William Kahn looked into engagement and disengagement at work. And in 1999, Amy Edmondson went in and looked at the importance of safety when solving real world problems. So in the slides that you will get afterwards, there's a link to Amy Edmondson's TED talk, which is a really good introduction to this topic. And what she found out was that uh, she went into a hospital, she looked into how many medical errors do we have. Um, and she found out that the departments that looked like they had the best working environment actually had the most errors. So they had the most, and what she found out was that they had the most reported errors. So when they started diving more into it, it turned out that the departments that felt safe reported every single medical error they found. So even if it was something uh, where you gave two headache pills instead of one, which would not make a big difference, they would actually report this. Whereas the departments where people felt unsafe, they only reported things if they really had to because they were afraid to be punished. So if we look at the IT industry, um, we have the Google project. So in 2014, Google went to look into how do we create high performing teams? And to be able to create them, they wanted to know what are the characteristics of high performing teams? And what they kind of expected was, uh, what is the seniority in the team? What kind of educations do we have? Stuff like that. And it turned out that that did not make a difference in all the projects that they looked at. So they decided to uh, look at different aspects and they pulled in Amy Edmondson's questions and looked at how psychologically safe was it. And that turned out to be the most significant um, different differentiator in creating uh, high performing teams. We also have modern agile, uh, which I think started around 2016 where one of the elements is make safety a prerequisite. So they are talking about what are the things we need to have before we can even talk about having an agile organization. Uh, and actually, in my opinion, I think this is a prerequisite for any kind of organization where you want really good results. I mean, you can get good results if you don't have safety, but you can get even better results when you do. 
So this is the result of Google. They found out that there were five elements that mattered when you were looking at high performing teams. There was the psychological safety. There was the dependability. Was the team good at delivering on time? Um, did they have structure and clarity, clear roles, plans and goals? Did they have meaning? Was the work important to them? And did they feel like they had impact? Mm -hmm. So these were the things, but the one thing that really stuck out was the psychological safety. So interesting enough, Google has a lot of teams that not, might not be as safe. Um, but even if all their teams were unsafe, I think they gave us a gift in actually coming up with this because what happened is a lot of companies look at the big ones and they go, oh, Google says psychological safety is important. So maybe we should take that into account. And if nothing else, I think that is worth a lot um, to us and the world for that matter. Uh, so while I use Amy Edmondson's work the most, I really like the, um, the definition of Khan, that psychological safety is being able to show and employ oneself without fear of negative consequences of self-image status or career. Because what it talks about is using ourselves, so showing who we are and using who we are which means our skills, our ideas, everything, without fear of negative consequence. So without being afraid to be punished in some form. And it's quite interesting because sometimes when we talk about these things, we talk about status or career. Oh, will I get fired? But there is also the element of self-image. Like if I am a senior something and I ask a question, will people think that I'm not as good as I'm supposed to be? Um, so, and the other part about this is that it is about fear, which means that we can have an environment that is actually safe, where nothing will happen, where you will not be punished, but people are afraid that they will be. Because what this also means is that we need to take into consideration where people come from. Like for many, many years, I would jump if somebody would come up, tap me on the shoulder and go, do you have a minute? Because I was fired that way in an organization in 2005, where the big bosses walked around and they tapped people on the shoulder and said, do you have a minute? And even though most people who tap me on the shoulder and ask me if I have a minute have nothing to do with that, it took a very long time before my body stopped reacting to it. So I was afraid of that, even though the um, the situation itself was actually safe. So Amy Edmondson looked a little bit into what will psychological safety help us with? And she put up these four things that psychological safety would help us ask questions. It will help us admit mistakes, offer idea and challenging norms. And if some of you have looked into modern agile, these are actually quite similar to what they are talking about. So they talk about asking questions, um, making mistakes, taking risks, being yourself, raising questions and offering ideas, I think. So having different sources that say the same thing, maybe they even have it from Amy. I'm not sure about that. But when you look at these things, they're kind of logical. Of course, that's what we need. And we don't need safety to do that. But we do, because sometimes we don't ask questions because we're afraid we're going to look ignorant. When I was working with this the first time, that was actually one of the things we found out was that it wasn't so much the young, young people, the one who started uh, in the organization like a year ago, who were afraid of asking questions. It was the old ones, the ones who had been there for maybe 10 years, who were afraid of asking questions because they felt, I am supposed to know that. So even though it seems like, of course, everyone asks questions, we might not because we're afraid that other people will think we're stupid. We don't admit mistakes sometimes because we don't want to look incompetent. So we try hiding them. Um, I've also experienced this in organizations where um, like I was working in a big bank at some point 
which had a firing round. And in Denmark, this was kind of the first time that banks had that. Before that, we the joke was always, you know, if, once you're in a bank, you're in a bank. You're in a bank for a lifetime, whether you work on IT or not. And they started cutting down on the IT department, which meant that, um, interesting enough, project managers were hiding their mistakes because they were afraid they were the next ones to go. Um, offering ideas, uh, we hold them back because we don't want to look intrusive. Maybe we come into an organization as new people and we go like, whoa, it would be really interesting if they did this. But we don't want to be the new one who comes in and challenges everything. Or maybe we're sitting in a team and everyone else thinks we should actually go in that direction. And you go like, what if we went in this direction? And you don't want to be the one who stands out. So if you don't have a safe environment, we're just going to keep those ideas to ourselves. And challenging norms is uh, held back because we don't want to look negative. So we don't want to go up and say, I'm not sure why we're doing these things because we don't want someone to say, oh, you're always so negative. Uh, I actually recently had this in an organization where I was called negative and told to be positive in a very aggressive tone, which was not very safe. Uh, not that it made me stop because part of what I have been doing in this um, as an agile coach is I do challenge norms. I ask curious questions about, wouldn't it be interesting if we tried this, for instance? Um, but in a non-safe organization, um, this will be seen as having a negative attitude. So I know some organizations, for instance, who have um, a value about being positive, which can be really amazing. Let's try to be positive. Let's look at options but it can also be weaponized. It can be used as don't be so negative. Remember, we have a positive, uh, we have a positive value. So don't be negative, don't bring all these problems. And I think that's one of the difficult things about psychological safety is that you can kind of use them in so many different ways. Um, and just a little bit of a twist of something can go from creating it into a unsafe environment. So the question is, do we actually need it? Um, and yes, we do. I like to use this quote from my friend, um, he's called Torbjörn, where he talks about things become better when we accept things as they are, not how we want them to be. And what I mean by this is, or what he means as, and I mean is, we shouldn't just accept things as they are, but we have to accept what they are right now before we can do something about them or not. And very often when we talk about psychological safety, we go like, yeah, but everyone should be able to ask questions or admit mistakes. And that's not helpful. If it is not safe for people to ask questions, we need to accept that, that we are in an organization where it's not safe. And then we can start working at it. Because if we just go, uh, yeah, everyone should be able to ask questions or one of the things I really hate is when people go, I expect everyone to be grown-ups, meaning I expect them to act in a specific way. Um, and to me, that's not about being a grown-up, first of all, uh, but we can't just expect people to act in a specific way if they have never learned it, for instance. One of the things I worked a lot on the last many years is also communication in a team. Like most of us come from some kind of technical background. And I learned a lot of things at university, but I did not learn how to communicate with other people. And yet we work in teams where we are supposed to communicate with other people. And if we just go, yeah, I expect them to be grown ups. I expect them to be able to collaborate. That's not just going to happen by magic. So sometimes we need to go in and do something about it. And we've seen some quite extreme cases of what happens when we don't have psychological safety. So uh, I guess all of you maybe uh, uh, have heard about the 787 Dreamliner, where two planes actually fell down before they started doing something about it. And this 
tweet is actually, I think, two years old. And the reports that have come out later is that there were actually multiple problems, multiple bugs in the, the 787. But the most scaring thing was that people were saying they had been punished or fired when they tried to lift the concerns. And these mistakes were being hidden, which then led to two airplanes falling down and killing a whole bunch of people. And while a lot of the things we have in our organizations might not be as serious, um, because we work with things like, I work at Mentimeter right now, we do an app where you can do presentations or you can do voting. If we make mistakes, it's hopefully not gonna kill anyone, whereas with planes it does, but it can actually still harm the product and the people working with it. So one of the big misunderstandings I have seen with safety and people talking about safety is that they think it is about being comfortable. And I, I really like this picture because that boy is not comfortable because maybe he hurt his knee or something, but he is safe. He is in his mother's arm and he is safe. And I, to me, this is a good example of how a safe organization can be. Because if we do something that uh, takes a whole system down, for instance, that's not gonna be comfortable. If somebody challenges this idea that we worked on for two months, that's not gonna be comfortable. Or if we challenge someone else's idea, but we want it to be safe. So safety is also about creating an environment where it is okay to be comfortable. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm going to rewind that. <laughs> safety is about creating an organization where it's okay to be uncomfortable. Um, and the quote that you had in the beginning about um, using growth and comfort together, I have that because I believe deeply that we do need comfort sometimes. If we go around being uncomfortable the whole time, eventually our, our body will go into panic uh, because it's going to uh, be afraid. So while safety allows us to be uncomfortable, we also do need the comfort sometimes. Especially like if we are growing a lot, if we are learning a lot, we need to take that step back and kind of take it in, being comfortable, because otherwise it's not going to be sustainable. Um, then we're just going to run like crazy and learn lots of things and our brain is not going to take that. And at some point it's going to shut down in form of stress and burnout, for instance. But it is important to realize that we can have safety without being comfortable. If we look at some of the things that um, I've heard as an argument against psychological safety, um, we can look at performance. So some people say, oh yeah, but if people are safe, we're not gonna have a uh, high performance because people are just, you know, why would they do things? So Amy has a section in her book, Fearless Organization, where she talks about different elements compared to psychological safety. And one of the things she talks about is our standard of performance, uh, going from low standard to high standard. And when I'm talking about our standard of performance, it is not just the outside, it's not just the organization's standard of performance, but it is also our own standard of performance. Because we can have really high standards internally, even if the company does not expect something of us, or we can have low standards even in an, in an organization with a lot of pressure. So this is kind of trying to be a combination of it. So, oops, wrong way. So if we have low psychological safety, and we have low standards, what happens is we go into the apathy zone. Nothing really happens. We are not going to try things out because it's not safe. And maybe we don't really care that much or the organization doesn't care as much. This is the scary one where we have low psychological safety and high standards. And this is what we call the anxiety zone. So if you do not have the safety, but you are under high pressure, whether that is from the inside or the outside, what happens is you go into anxiety. And the interesting part about anxiety uh, or scary part is that it kind of disables the front part of our brain, which is the one that we really want to use. 
uh, when we're working, especially in knowledge management or knowledge work as we do. If we have really high psychological safety, but low standards, we have a comfort zone because there's no need for challenging ourselves or trying to do a lot of good things. Because if the organization doesn't have any standard for a high standard for performance and we don't, then, you know, why bother? Um, it's nice here. Um, and this is something where I have sometimes seen uh, agile organizations think they need to be. This is where we want to be. We want to be in high standards and high psychological safety. And when I talk about high standards in this case, um, and also Amy does, um, but my take on it is a lot of it has to come from the inside. It has to be also us wanting to do things because if it's pushed on us from the organization, that means we have low psychological safety. So by having high psychological safety, um, I believe that um, a lot of it needs to come from the inside. If we are here, this is what we call the learning zone, the high performance zone, because most of what we work on is actually learning. Very few things we do as knowledge workers is just doing the same thing over and over again. Where a lot of like the theories of how we work and such have been created during the industrial revolution and after, where what we tried to do was to make it as efficient as possible and people doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, we split people up in factories so that they could do things uh, as fast as possible. But a lot of what we do, I would say most of what we do in knowledge uh, companies and as knowledge workers is about learning, trying out new things, making new things work. And if we have that safety and we have the high standards where people expect stuff of us and we expect stuff of ourselves, then we will go into the learning and high performance zone. So of course, this is where we want to be. I mean, who doesn't want to be in a high performance team? So how do we actually create this safety? So Amy Edmondson very much attacks this from a point of view of the organization. So as an organization, you need to look into your domains. Uh, she has four domains that she talks about. And one of them is, what is the attitude to risk and failure? If people do fail or take a risk, what happens? Are they punished? Do people actually take risks? Do they admit failures? And if not, that's something that needs to go in and be addressed. So some of the things that I have seen that can go against safety is saying, oh, we have a zero fault culture because we all make mistakes. I mean, we have backspace on our computers for a reason. We all make mistakes. So looking into that and figuring out, is this a good thing? And you know, if we make a mistake, of course, we need to talk about it. We need to learn from it. But if we are not allowed to make mistakes or if we're afraid to do this, we are not going to um, have a safe environment. And we are also, by admitting our own mistakes, we also help other people admit their mistakes. The other part about a safe organization is looking into what is the willingness to help? How does it work in an organization if an individual needs help? Do other people help that person? What happens if a team needs help, if a department needs help? And the more willingness to help you have in an organization, the safer uh, you, can, you can build it. Can we have open conversations about things? Do people actually discuss things? Or do they talk about things that are less important because they're afraid to talk about the open uh, things or the, the difficult things? As an example, the bank I was in where I talked about people getting fired, um, there were a lot of organizational changes and people were really not happy, but nobody talked about it. And then they removed the tray from the cantina. So people did not have a tray for the food anymore. And that became a big discussion subject because people were not afraid to discuss this because this was not challenging the organization itself. But 
people were afraid to talk about why are we doing this? Why are we changing the departments? Why are we firing people? So looking at that and ensuring that we have an open conversation uh, is very important. And the last thing that she talks about is how is the company on, on inclusion and diversity? And to have truly safe teams, uh, you can say that if you have a team where everyone is the same, whether that is gender, education, culture, it can feel safer. And um, that can be one way of doing it. But what will also happen in that is that we are not going to get those interesting things because people will not be making the same mistakes. People are not going to take the same risks as someone who is a little bit different. And the other part of, of this um, domain is the inclusion. So for a very long time, uh, we have only looked at diversity in a lot of IT organizations or other organizations where we look at how many women do we have or how many people of color do we have, for instance. And that is not enough to actually create that safety. We need to include people. So we need to not only invite people in, we need to allow them to be who they are. And actually we need to celebrate who they are. So if we just invite people in and ask them to be exactly like us, then we have not gained anything by diversity. Quite the opposite, because the people who are diverse are going to feel very unsafe because they are afraid to be who they are. They are afraid to speak up. And um, it is quite interesting looking at this. I mean, I have talked about more women in IT for a long time. And by the way, also we need more men in IT. So we need the ones who are not applying for IT now. But one of the things we can see is that a lot of the role models we have had have actually been women who needed to act as men uh, to kind of fulfill the same role to be able to fit into the organization. Um, and that's kind of sad because women comes in all shapes and forms. And, and if we don't bring them in this way, we don't see the, all the things. Same with culture, same with age, ability, uh, all of the things. And to create a safe organization, we need to look at how do we actually handle these things. So this is kind of from an organizational perspective. So Amy also looks at what happens as a leader. What can you do as a leader? And while I think that she mainly talks about people who are officially leaders, like a manager of a department or manager of some people, I believe that this is true for all kinds of leaders. And all of us are leaders, I believe, because if nothing else, we lead by example. So if you are a leader, which I believe you are, you can do these three things. You can frame the work as learning. You can talk about the work that we're doing as learning instead of talking about it as production. Because very few things of the stuff that we do are actually production. Of course, there are stuff that are production uh, and where we do the same things over and over again. But a lot of what we do is about learning. And by framing things as learning, by doing that reframing, what happens is that the things that we look at, it becomes easier to take a risk. It becomes easier to make that mistake because we're learning. So that makes it safer. She talks about modeling curiosity. So if you're not agreeing with somebody, if somebody is saying something, uh, oh, we should use this instead of that. Be curious about that. Oh, that's interesting. Can you tell me more about these things? So model that curiosity and and truly show that you are interested in why people are doing what they're doing, why they're thinking as they're thinking. Uh, and what she doesn't write, but what I see as part of the curiosity is not blaming. So instead of judging and blaming, oh, you want to do this thing, go like, oh, this is really interesting. Tell me more. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to use that thing, but without having that curiosity, it's not going to be safe to speak about and we're not going to get those amazing ideas. And this is the one that took me like a week to actually get to pronounce, but show fallibility. 
So show that you make mistakes. Uh, and this is something uh, I think a lot of leaders today, uh, the higher up you come, the harder it is, is to show this fallibility. Because the old fashioned leader is supposed to be the one who's kind of on top of everything and knows everything. So showing that vulnerability, showing that you make mistakes is really, really hard because people have come into the high positions by not doing that, by showing that they are in control. But by actually showing that we make mistakes, uh, like we did a tech check on Monday uh, to make sure this worked, which means I did not because I fell asleep and forgot I had a tech check, so we had to do it Tuesday. But by showing that, yes, sometimes we do make mistakes, and I'm sorry about that mistake. We also show other people that it is okay to make mistakes. And one of the things I think that's important here is that when you then show your fallibility, how you frame it, because if you say, oh, I'm so stupid, I made this mistake. What you're saying is that making mistakes is stupid. So don't do that. Say, I made this mistake, um, or, you know what, I really struggle with this, help me, would you help me learn about it? So these are actually quite simple things that most of us can do right away, even though it's really scary sometimes to admit your mistakes. These are things each individual can also do to help create safety. So these are more things that I have found to help with safety. I found that setting clear expectations to people um, is something that helps create safety because then people know what to expect. And it doesn't, of, of course, it doesn't mean said that these are set in stone, there's nothing you can do about it, but setting these expectations so that people know it. And especially now that I have become a manager, I have to do what I've been telling managers to do for years and set these expectations to the people that I am helping growing. So like one of my expectations is that I expect them to come to me for help that if they struggle with something, they come to me. And even though that is an expectation, I think most managers or leaders have, or I like to do it explicitly because then it becomes quite explicit for the other person that this is okay. And even though we talk a lot about in agile about autonomy, autonomy actually means within a frame. So setting these expectations so that we know where can we go and where can't we go. And then listen to people. Very often we listen so that we can answer people. And it is really important to listen to people so you hear what they're saying. And it's amazing what people will tell you if you just listen to them. And that helps create safety because then people know that you see them and you hear them. Care about people. It uh, doesn't mean that we necessarily need to all be friends, but you do need to have care for people to create that safety. Um, and actually these two are my main coaching tools. Uh, when people say, oh, what do you use? And they expect some kind of tool uh, where you have to take a training. I say, I listen to people and I care about them. And I think that is one of the reasons why I am good at creating safety for people. While it seems like very simple things, it is also things that you can train and, and we can all get better at, I can get better at it. Giving and receiving feedback in a good way. So not talking about the person, but we're talking about behaviors, talking about products, talking about code, is also part of creating safety because if we have a good feedback environment, we also know what is going on. We know how people are reacting we know why they are reacting this way, and so that also helps us. And is it just me, or uh, I think you lost it there? Uh, okay. Maybe that I, I clicked wrong. Uh, get the helps. No, no, no. So, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's a very vulnerable moment when you're speaking and people can't hear you. So uh, being vulnerable is also good. And I think this is something that is easy to do on different levels. 
So one part of being vulnerable can be asking for help. Another one can be admitting your mistakes. Uh, it can be talking about, I have a really bad day today because I didn't sleep. Um, or um, sometimes I suffer from depression. So that means that I am not going to act the way I normally do. So there are like really a lot of levels of vulnerability. So it, this is an easy one to also start with. Be curious, be curious about people, be curious about why they're doing what they're doing. Be curious about your surroundings. Listen to people because when you actually listen to people, you will hear a lot more than you're expecting. And repeat yourself. Um, sometimes when we, as some form of leader say something, we expect other people to have heard it. And while they may have heard the word, it's not necessarily that it goes in. So part of creating safety for me is also about repeating these things, repeating um, the vulnerability, repeating the listening, repeating the expectations, because our brains are fragile and sometimes we forget. And the last one, of course, you need to repeat yourself. So uh, remember to listen to people. So wrap up, psychological safety is very important. And while it is hard sometimes to achieve, it is totally worth it. Being safe does not always mean comfort. In fact, we do need discomfort to learn and grow. And it takes a lot of effort, but it's totally worth it. And no matter what your role is, you can do something to create safety or to create unsafety. So also consider how do you act at work and what do you need to be able to feel safe at your work? Thank you very much. You will get these slides. There is my contact information as well. And there is um, there's a bunch of links. And if you want to know more, you can always let me know. So let's see. Thank you. Thank you, Gitta. Thank you very much. And on Slido, we have uh, quite a few questions. So if you give me a go, we'll start with that. Sure. All right. So the first question we have here is, how can we manage those who say it's safe, we are transparent, and then use the information they hear against those who said it? Oh, yeah. That's an interesting one. I have exactly experienced that, uh, both of them. But they go like, I don't understand why people don't feel safe. I told them this is a safe environment. Um, and I think in this case, what we need to do is if we experience someone who shares information that we have told them in confidence, we need to give them that feedback. We need to give and give them quite specific feedback. I told you this in confidence and now I hear it from a different side. Uh, so I am not feeling that the safe environment that we talked about exists. Um, what we also need to remember is that I would say something like this might be on purpose, but we also need to be aware that we are going to make mistakes with all these things. So even though we want to do as much as we can to create safety, we are going to make mistakes. So it could also be a mistake from that person's perspective that they didn't think about it. If they are used to, let's say, you're a manager of department and you're used to sharing that information with other managers, then you may not have considered that this is actually breaking the safety. I'm not saying that this is always the thing, but we need to, by giving them the feedback, also allow them to make mistakes. Because otherwise we're going to create an environment that is artificially safe, where people are so afraid to make mistakes that they're not going to speak up. They're not going to tell a joke because they're afraid they're going to hurt someone. And I mean, there are things that are totally out of bounds. Like you don't tell sexual or racist jokes and especially not at work, but maybe you'll tell a joke that um, hurts somebody else, but you don't know it. Like one of the things that is one of my big triggers is uh, insinuating that women in IT are not proper women because, you know, 
well, then they wouldn't be in IT. If you and and I know every time I talk about this, the guys are kind of like somebody says that, and the women go, "Yep, I heard that." Um, and that for me is a big, big trigger, and I will totally explode if anybody goes with that. And while that joke might be funny, um, you know, in one setting, it's not funny in another, and that person might not mean any harm. When I started working on Scrum, I would go like, Scrum is like your mother-in-law. If there is a problem, she will highlight it, uh, which I thought was really <laughs> funny. But on the other hand, what you are talking about is a stereotype of mother-in-laws who are mean and picking on you, which is actually not very nice. Um, so I try to go like it's a flashlight, it will highlight everything. But when I started doing that joke, it was, I did not mean any harm. So we need to also in organization have the ability to make mistakes like that. And of course, when somebody came up and said that to me, I was like, oh, I did not think about that. And I owned my mistake. But if it, if it had not been safe for me to make that mistake, I would have stopped with everything. You know, because then I would be like, okay, it was a very long answer. Sorry. Oh, I think it's a great answer. Uh, I hope the person who asked that question uh, feels their answer. The question was answered. All right. Yeah, the next uh, question is from Franz. Can companies create a safe environment or safe culture, or can they just try different measures and hope that it evolves? So measures as communication, training, transparency, or so. I don't think an organization can totally ensure a safe environment, but I think that if they take enough measures, these environments will happen. Uh, what I usually see in organizations is that it takes a while before things start going. Usually the safety will start in teams or among individuals, then departments, and then maybe in the whole organization. But yes, they can do these things. So. Last year, uh, my friend Morgan and I did awareness training in an organization. So everyone who wanted to could join a two hour uh, awareness training about psychological safety, for instance, so that they could start having this conversation. And it's really interesting seeing this really senior developer going, oh, when I answer pull requests, I need to be careful how I phrase things because I am the senior one, which means I am the role model and people look to me, this is how you address problems in the code. So I, I believe that you, you can do a lot of things, but I don't think you can ever ensure this also because it is individual. But by having the conversation, by creating that environment, by handling things that will happen in all organizations, right? I believe that we can, be lucky enough for it to be created, but I don't think we can ensure it. Thank you. Thank you, Gita. The next question we have is, you cannot just learn psychological safety. You have to practice it. What are some exercises uh, in teams to practice psychological safety? So one of the things that I've done in teams, uh, for instance, is so the, there's the six dimensions in modern agile. And we have used, Morgan and I invented this to kind of take those and then have a retrospective with that focus. And people could vote on the six dimensions. Uh, they had three votes. They had two ears and one mouth because sometimes we should listen more than we speak. And they could put the ear on, okay, I want to hear more about from the others in the team about being yourself and taking risks. And I would like to say something about raising problems. And then we took the top one and we treated it as we would a normal topic in a retrospective, looking into what does this actually mean? Heard from the people um, who wanted to he or who wanted to speak about these things. And then we started doing small exercises, uh, so small experiments. And it was really interesting to see because the teams picked very different things. So one team picked fuck up of the week because they say we always talk about making mistakes and then we take post-it notes. So post-it notes was supposed to be a really, really strong glue. They made a really weak glue, which turned into creating post-it notes. And now they make shitloads of money on this. 
So we, if we only talk about mistakes like this, then we are only talking about the things that become successes. So they decided that after every stand-up on Fridays, they would do fuck up of the week. What is the biggest mistake from this week where all that I learned is I shouldn't do that again? Um, another team decided that every time they had to make an important decision that they would do a round and ask people their opinion and especially the two very introverted not speaking up people. And this was a suggestion actually from the two most extroverted in the team because they were like, I'm afraid that we are going to miss out on some important things if you only hear from me and John. So they decided to do this. Some decided to do this thing, um, this exercise by Reins, uh, JP Reinsberger called What's Wrong With This Code? Where you take a piece of code together in the team, someone facilitates and you look at the code. So that's one thing you can do is you can kind of go into the team and figure out what is a thing we would like to experiment with or something where we think this is where we need to, to do a little bit more. Um, I have also done empathy exercises, helping people learn more about empathy uh, because it is a muscle that can be trained. Um, and I have been using some of the stuff from Alex Harms. Uh, they have a book about uh, technical trainers on Leanpub. I'll just write down that I will put Alex's book in the links as well. Um, and I think just um, talking to each other, I think is important. So using for instance, retrospectives as a format is good because a lot of teams already use retrospectives. Thank you. The next question, um, top managers will ask how much is the investment in psychological, in <laughs> psychological safety and what is the uh, ROI, uh, how to respond, the uh, return on invest? Yeah. Yeah, I hate that. Uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have seen that. And uh, that is one of the reasons I have been using Amy Edmondson's video. I have not yet found a good answer for this. What I have found, uh, what I use as arguments is more the things from uh, from Google showing that if you want high performing teams, you do need to have psychological safety. Showing the things from Amy where she talks about, uh, she talks very much about it from a company perspective. And I think that one of the things we are missing a bit uh, in the literature about psychological safety is actually like money numbers. But I, I, I have not found a good way to put a number on it. I can tell you a little bit about how much it will cost. Like if all teams need to do a two hour training, you can, you can put that cost on. But then there's also the cost when people start talking about these things and actually want to have the things implemented. So, um, uh, sorry, I haven't found a good answer for this one yet. I always have to remember to say yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Fair enough. Uh, the next question is, Gita, you said high standards, a lot of it has to come from the inside. How to encourage for high standards? Well, one of the things we can do to encourage for high standards is to have expectations. But I think another part of it is to figure out what makes people tick. Um, I think that when I look at how my parents worked, for instance, they went to work mostly to get money. When I look at how my generation and especially the younger generation uh, are looking at things, they are like, how can I make a difference? How can I have an impact? And I think that if you figure out what makes people tick, if you figure out what drives people, like, are you actually doing this because you want to help people, for instance, I think that will also get a drive. Uh, and you can also, you can, I mean, there's the book Drive by Daniel Pink, which talks about autonomy, mastery, purpose. So allowing people to have mastery in their craft, to work with things, to have that purpose where they're going and have that autonomy within the frame. I think things like that help drive internal motivation. Um, money can be motivating, but only to a certain point. So research shows that when you get to a certain point, 
those are not really the things that drive us, that gives us that motivation. Um, and I think that I, I would, sometimes I would hope that more of us would actually consider which company are we in? Are we actually in a company where we believe on the product they are creating? Um, and if not, change to that. But also as an organization, remember to communicate this. I mean, when I was working as a consultant in Spotify, one of the things I saw was that a lot of the managers were talking about, we need X million users, blah, 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 in this area. And most of the people working in the teams were, I mean, they was like, yeah, this is okay. But what really made them want to perform was, we are going to bring music into places that where people have not had access to all this music before. Um, and like one of the teams I was working with was looking at bandwidth, for instance. So how do we spread music so that people in areas with really bad Wi-Fi, like Germany, uh, <laughs> can actually get this music? No, I'm just kidding. They didn't talk about Germany. I've just been traveling in Germany sometimes and the data is interesting. Uh, no, but drive, they were driven by the fact that they were helping people get access to music more than they were driven by, yeah, we have X million users or what, how many users it was. So as an organization, you can also do that kind of talk about what is the value of what we are creating? What does it help? And I think that the, the more the generations are changing, the more I think this is going to be important for organizations as well. Thank you. So Thank you. next question is from Lutz. How does framing product work as learning fit with a product goal or value creation objectives? Will teams really buy this uh, into this? <laughs> yes, I think they do. I think that when we are talking about, no matter what we are creating, um, when you talk about that, what we are really creating here, um, of course, we want to create a product, but the way to get to that product is learning what is the best way of doing there. And I think that talking about these things in a different way and not like, yes, you should produce this new uh, web page for Mentimeter, but yeah, we want to learn a way to figure out how we can present this in a different way. And I think just by framing it that way, instead of saying you need to produce that website is we want to learn how we can enable people to do these things. That will make a difference. And of course, it takes a while. It's not like you just put a new frame and then people go, oh, now I get it. But starting to think about it and also ourselves, starting to think about, well, what we're doing is actually learning. We are not just typing in a recipe. We are actually learning things. We're doing small experiments all the time. With, otherwise, we wouldn't need tests, for instance, if we were not making all these experiments. We are learning, we are growing all the time. And I do think that, yes, I think that people will buy into this. Most, at least. Thank you. Um, so we are a little bit short in time. There are still a lot of questions to go and I'm wondering what to do about that. Um, so I will just go ahead and ask it. I apologize in advance if that's not okay for you. Um, but can we forward you the questions uh, later on and you can give us short written answers that we could post on the mirror board? Would that be okay? Yeah, I won't be or, able to do it until the weekend though. Uh, so they won't be there fair. today, that's but fine. you can see them later. That's fine. And also if you think Brilliant. about a question that you didn't feel like asking in the forum or you just think of something later, uh, like I said, my contact information is in the, in the slides as well. And uh, otherwise, I hope I will see you at the German coach camp or at another conference or on conference. I love on conferences because that gives you the opportunity to meet people you did not expect to meet. Uh, and I think that is the serendipity of these things is just the most amazing thing. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Gitta, for the offer. Uh, so everyone, your question, uh, who put in a question in Slido and their question wasn't answered till now, as uh, you just heard me ask Gitta and Gitta 
promising us to give us some answers later on. Just um, have a look at the mirror board in a few days after the weekend, and we'll try to put all the questions and the answers we get from GitHub over there. All right. And so we come to the end of the keynote. Thank you very much, Gita. Thank you for the very uh, inspiring speech. Uh, thank you for all the questions from everyone and the answers. Gita, please feel free to stay at the bar camp, visit sessions or other talks uh, if you have time, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sadly I don't, but I am really happy uh, that you invited me and it was really a pleasure and especially a pleasure to see also all your known faces. Um, Sometimes you don't know how much you miss people until you see them again. Um, I hope you have an amazing day. I could see from some of the feedback from yesterday that it was amazing yesterday. So enjoy and hopefully we will meet out there in the real world at some point. Hopefully. Thanks very much, Gita. Thank you. Bye.